Thank you for listening to the Voices of UMass Chan, featuring the people, ideas, and advances of UMass Chan Medical School. Welcome to a new episode of the Voices of UMass Chan. I'm your host, Jennifer Berryman. We've got a fascinating conversation today. You have likely heard about the connection between your brain, your gut, and your overall health. Today, we're diving into research focused specifically on looking at what connection there might be between the microbiome in our guts and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. What role could the microbiome play in cognitive decline? John Heron is an MD, PhD, professor of emergency medicine and microbiology and physiological systems, and clinical director of the Center for Microbiome Re Research here at UMass Chan. We're joined by Dr. Heron and Ethan Lowe, who is an MD, PhD candidate who came to UMass Chan in 2018. Thank you both so much for making time to speak with us today. Great. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks, Jen. Dr. Heron, get us started, if you will. Just give us a quick refresher. What do you mean when you say microbiome in our gut? And how do we think it impacts our overall health? When you talk about the microbiome, it is the collection of microorganisms that uh, reside in our gut. And we live in balance with these microbes. And they help to really give us the nutrients and they process uh, foods for us. They do a lot of beneficial things, but they can also do a lot of negative things for us too. And so when I say microorganisms, I do mean like viruses, archaea and bacteria, but mostly we focus on the back, the biggest component of that, which is the bacterial community that resides in the gut and how it affects our health. And it has been, uh, there's been a lot of research over the last decade to two decades, looking at associations between the gut microbiome and, and different aspects of health. And uh, we are really trying to push that forward with Alzheimer's disease and, and specifically with uh, the aging gut microbiome and how it changes and how that influences uh, older adult health. Yeah. So give us um, a snapshot of some of the research projects that you've got underway looking at this connection to Alzheimer's disease in older people. It really started with my work here. I was a part of the Millennium program, getting my PhD here at UMass after I already had my MD and finished my residency training. And I was here as a uh, attending physician in emergency medicine. And uh, as part of that, I've got funding to look at uh, nursing home residents and specifically how pathogens spread amongst nursing home residents. Uh, that is work that's ongoing today. But what we, we have done with that uh, is uh, about eight years ago, roughly, uh, I was presenting at uh, the National Institute of Aging, like one of their conferences, and one of the program officers really introduced me to the, the gut microbiome and uh, its relationship to the gut-brain access. And so uh, that's where I started branching off and looking at the gut-brain access specifically. But the projects that we have looking at the gut microbiome have to do with pathogen, pathogen spread in the nursing home. And we've also taken a look at both the gut and oral microbiome in relation to other infections, such as COVID. That work has been kind of backburnered a little bit, but definitely the, the main focus that we're driving on now is how the gut microbiome influences uh, inflammation, systemic inflammation, and how that relates to Alzheimer's disease. And then we also do work, which uh, Ethan is part of looking at frailty and how the gut microbiome relates to when people get older and they, they develop a frail phenotype. I want to just put a finer point on something I think you said, the gut-brain access. What is there physiologically? Is there a direct line between our gut and our brain? Yep. So when I mentioned this meeting eight years ago, and I was presented this by a program officer at NIA, at NIA I was had the same reaction. What the heck is that? <laughs> like, I don't believe, how does, how does the bacteria in your gut to have anything to do with your brain? And when uh, you look at the research, you know, this really started about 12, 15 years ago. Uh, with germ-free mice when they took away all their bacteria in the gut, what they noticed was the mice acted very differently. They were anxious. They were they um, had different genes that were activated in their brain. Like they were completely different mice. And then the fascinating thing was once once you gave them a normal mice mouse microbiome back, they recovered everything. So they were like less anxious, more sociable. And then, so that kind of kicked off the whole gut brain access. And then I would say the past decade or so has focused on a lot of research looking at Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and uh, other mental disorders and how the, the bacteria in the gut can affect or, or associate with it. And exactly how that happens is being worked out. And I think it's very different and there's probably multiple processes. So 
some of them focus on what the metabolites are being produced by the microbiome that then trans then then translocate and go into the brain. Others are how it affects our immune system in our gut. About 70, 80% of our immune system is actually just focused on our gut itself. And we kind of, that's how our immune system gets trained and how we grow up and learn. So that's another aspect to it. The vagal nerve is another way in which people believe that the, the gut communicates. And it is a, a two-way access simply said, like if you ever had like stress and you feel like you're going to the bathroom more, like, yes, your brain can affect your gut. But now we really focus on what's going on in the gut and how that relates back to uh, functions in the brain. That's so fascinating. Thanks for taking a minute to explain that. So um, Ethan, maybe you can jump in here. Why is it important for scientists and physicians to sort of understand and look at what's happening in the gut of older people? Like, what is it? Is there something that we think changes over time as people age? As adults get older, um, I think they're at a predisposition to some illnesses that might not be as prevalent in younger populations. Folks move off into uh, uh, long-term care facilities. Um, they're sharing similar diets. And there is a greater risk for um, syndromes such as frailty syndrome. And we're still working out the underlying cause of what might cause this. Um, a lot may be related to diet, a lot may be related to changes in the microbiome that occur over time in old age. And it's still really unclear to us what drives these changes. Perhaps it's um, dietary related changes, perhaps it's changes in the immune system that occur naturally with aging, a phenomenon called immunosenescence, where your immune cells sort of develop are older and less active. And so by understanding the role of the microbiome, we can understand both how the bacteria in the gut might be communicating uh, to the body in a way that leads to these ailments of aging, or perhaps understand some of the underlying physiology of aging by looking at changes in the microbiome and seeing um, how those affect the uh, behavior in the guts of these older adults. And, and when we think about the six, seven plus million Americans who are living with Alzheimer's, this is something that affects a lot of different families. And so we really want to uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of people who really would like to understand this better, including yourselves. What does the evidence tell you so far about the guts of older Americans? And what are the questions that you're still trying to unravel? So specifically with the the guts in older Americans, I mean, there's certain things that we know about, like a loss in diversity, the differences in the bacteria, they go down as you age. Um, but you know, this is not, doesn't have to be the case. When you look at super agers, uh, people who are healthy into their hundreds, they definitely have a diversity in their microbiome that looks similar to people in their 50s and 60s or who are healthy. And not just that, but also who's there, like what's the mix of like healthy versus unhealthy. And this is kind of a, a poor term, but we do use it all the time as far as labeling a certain bacterial species as either healthy or unhealthy. But those balances change as you get older too. But once again, they don't have to. And so I think, you know, one of the holy grails for aging with the microbiome is trying to figure out how do I keep my microbiome as someone who's healthy in their hundreds rather than someone who's, you know, sicker and older and, you know, more frail. Ethan, so we heard a little bit about how Dr. Heron kind of got into this line of study. Can you share a little bit about your background, how you got involved in this area of research and, and what you've learned and what, what floats your boat about doing it? So I came into graduate school, like really naive to what I want to do. I had a um, open mind to trying out different experiences and always had a bit of attraction to the microbiome. I was you know, in college, maybe in, in 2012, 2011, and an article from a just a journalist blew my mind about this world of bacteria living in our guts that affects our, our mental state, how we behave. And I felt like it was the best kept secret in science. Like it was hugely consequential, but nobody talked about it. Um, I would come to learn because nobody really knew much about it, right? And when I came to UMass, I got really looped in with the work of Dr. Heron and Dr. Beth McCormick, who were studying the microbiome in different contexts. Dr. McCormick in the sense of um, intestinal inflammation and inflammatory bowel disorders, and Dr. Heron with the gut-brain access. And I was just so interested how these changes at a very distant place in our bodies, in our guts, could be communicated elsewhere to have such a huge impact. Um, and Alzheimer's disease has really become one of the ideal standards to look, look into in this case because uh, of its impact. It's so consequential for so many families. You know, so a small difference here in our understanding of disease can make a huge difference for the families and, and older adults with Alzheimer's disease. And it's a really exciting fundamental question about what's going on here that we just don't know much about right now. To both of you, um, how do you 
anticipate that some findings from these research studies might impact what we're able to know and understand about neurodegenerative diseases other than Alzheimer's. I think you mentioned Parkinson's. What what about some of these other diseases that you might glean insights about? The way I've thought about the microbiome in, in general, right, is it's a collection of microorganisms, largely bacteria, that we as a species have evolved with for thousands and thousands of years. And as a result, they play a really integral role in health and in disease. So by looking at the presence or absence of specific bacteria, it can give us insight into how our bodies work. And we're starting to uncover uh, both our, in our lab, and I think as a scientific field as a whole, really unique ways in which our body functions and responds in the settings of these bacteria. And these, these effects might be specific in some diseases um, or maybe more generalizable, say, you know, uh, leading to change in the immune system, inflammation that can go on to worsen symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, of Parkinson's disease, and are really acting in some cases to start or in some cases to exasperate pre-existing illnesses. So it's this fundamental biology, I think, that we're starting to untangle that is giving insights more broadly into types of inflammatory and neuroinflammatory diseases that can be shared. So the research that you're doing right now, tell us about some of the studies that you have underway. The kind of the the goal of like our funding, which I'll give a shout out to the Alzheimer's Association that has really gotten us started and continues to keep us funded um, in the National Institute of Aging. But what we're doing is, uh, I kind of alluded to it before, there's been a lot of studies saying good and bad bacteria associated with good and bad outcomes and health and you know so we're trying to really go beyond that and so what that includes is it includes a, a team first off uh, ethan already mentioned that beth mccormick who's really like a, a gut mucosal uh, immunology interaction expert in that from the microbiology standpoint and then we also have bonnie bucci who does a lot of the mathematical modeling and ai and then uh, doyle ward who is also a bacterial specialist and so we, we bring all these people together that really help in multiple aspects and so what we're trying to do besides moving past associations is look at a couple different things. One is like di disease course over time. So a lot of studies take a snapshot of an individual, but we're really, uh, the work we have ongoing now, we have um, a couple hundred people that are involved in this study that are from the community in and around Worcester uh, that come to the clinic and that we see every three months and they give samples for us and we follow them over time to see how their health, and this is focused on Alzheimer's disease, but we're really trying to get multiple snapshots over time to see what's going on. And then be, going beyond just what bacteria are there, good or bad, and associated with things, we're really trying to get down to mechanisms. So what's functioning in the microbiome? And, and we have definitely honed in on several of these mechanisms that we're exploring further. We have uh, a cohort of nursing home uh, that has been closed, but actually we're, we're enrolling in the nursing home again. We have this community cohort that we have. And so we can compare findings across very different groups of people. And then we can bring that knowledge to the lab and we can apply it to uh, different assays uh, on the bench top, or we can use different animal models and especially Alzheimer's transgenic animal models. And we can either treat them differently or, or transplant stool from people like with Alzheimer's and without Alzheimer's, or even with Alzheimer's while they're doing well and when they're not doing so well cognitively. And we can see what those groups of bacteria do. And then we can also do it individually. Uh, and Ethan's got a couple real mechanisms that he's been hitting on that are of interest. So I'll, I'll let him take it from here. Now, one point uh, I want to underscore that John makes is uh, one particular thing about doing microbiome research, it really does take a team of experts to come together and do this. So we have our you know, mucosal immunologist, our microbiologist, we have our um, biophoreticians all coming together to help with this project. It's been really essential to helping us progress as we are. Uh, so following up on some of this longitudinal work we're doing, following older adults with Alzheimer's disease, looking at changes in the microbiome, looking at changes in the immune cell to understand a mechanism. How are bacteria causing these effects of immune cell changes of neuroinflammation and of cognitive decline? We're starting to focus in on a few mechanisms. Um, one of those mechanisms is uh, we think promoting, you know, worsening um, symptoms in Alzheimer's disease. And we've are hopefully we're going to identify a different one that when present is a protective experience. Uh, we're looking at production of a essential amino acid, uh, methionine, from the bacteria in the gut of older adults with Alzheimer's disease. And we're theorizing that this metabolite goes on to lead to immune cell proliferation, differentiation toward a more active and inflammatory immune system. And this inflammation um, is well known in Alzheimer's disease. The underlying cause of it is, is still really contested. But we suspect that the bacteria in the gut are playing a role through the signaling of methionine 
to lead to stomach inflammation and eventually neurocognitive decline. On the flip side of that coin, we've identified a bacteria that's present in healthier older adults that seems to be absent in adults with Alzheimer's disease and absent further still in adults with worsening Alzheimer's disease. This makes a bacteria makes a metabolite, the product that activates estrogen signaling in the intestine. And we think that effect is used to stimulate host defenses against pathogens or pathobionts, uh, uh, you know, adverse negative bacteria, um, preventing colonization and inflammation. And so we think this protective system is sort of turned off or dialed way down in Alzheimer's disease and could be a signal to start a inflammatory response um, that goes on to um, become the wildfire we know as the neuroinflammation and Alzheimer's disease. So the hope would be, I guess, is that once you're able to better understand these mechanisms and what's helping, what's maybe hindering um, cognitive acuity, then maybe there would be some way to sort of activate the good and deactivate the bad, right? I mean, do you think that clinical applications like that could be on the horizon? That's exactly what we're doing. And that's what we're focused on is, uh, you know, with the bad back, the bad bacteria, the negative processes that are going on, how can you protect against that? How can you remove that is one aspect of it. And then the other one that uh, Ethan was mentioning is it would be perfect for a probiotic design. And how can you give somebody that bacteria back so that it can add benefit? The cool thing about this is the methionine story, at least we see, we saw it initially in one group of, of older adults. We've confirmed it in another group of older adults. We're now doing different assays to kind of confirm it. So we're really focusing on a mechanism and not just seeing it in one snapshot. And we're, we're actually seeing it, how it changes over time and negatively affects uh, older adults, cognitive, cognitive health. And, uh, and we're combining that with also measuring the molecule itself. So we're not just looking at the bacteria because there's different ways to probe the microbiome. So we're not looking at just who's there, but we're also looking at what metabolites are producing and we're manipulating those. And so we're really trying to build a complete story around it uh, to help drive and really focus like probiotic design. Cause when you design a probiotic, it's not like it was in the past. It's a, it's a community matrix. And so we're really trying to figure out what's the best mixture of good bacteria to hopefully boost those that are good and bring down those that are, are having a negative effect. And especially, you know, along the timeline, because it, with Alzheimer's disease, you can have it and you can have Alzheimer's for a long time, or you could have it and you could fall off a cliff pretty soon with as far as like your mental functioning. And so we're really focused on that part of it. Like, what can we have people live a lot longer and healthier life, maintaining their cognition over time um, by developing the, these uh, these probiotics. We'll be eager to keep tabs on your future research and what you guys learn. So please keep us posted. And I am curious for people who might be listening and interested in enrolling in that community cohort. Is that something that you're currently um, enrolling for or is that closed? If someone's interested to be part of the study, we, we, we are ongoing. Uh, we are really are focused on people with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and also those with other forms of dementia. Uh, and we do run this clinic where we bring people in. Uh, and so uh, we have uh, email contact and phone numbers to, that can be used to reach out and be part of the study. Okay. And we'll make sure that we put those in the show notes um, so that anyone who's listening, who's interested in learning more or potentially enrolling in the study will have that information at their fingertips. John Heron and Ethan Lowe, thank you so much for making time to describe your work. It's really great. And we'll be eager to see what comes next. Thanks, Jen. A pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. If you like the Voices of UMass Chan podcast, we hope you'll subscribe so that you can get alerts when every new episode is released. And if you have an idea for a future guest or a topic that you'd like us to think about, email us at umasschancommunications at umassmed.edu. Follow us at UMass Chan on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. On YouTube, find us at UMass Chan Medical School.